Oh, it's crazy. It's just fucking crazy, man. <laughs> oh, if only they knew the sacrifices. If only they fucking knew. Basically where I'm at at the minute is I'm just coming off my fourth handbrake in 12 months. It's now March 2018 and I had my professional debut in February 2017 and I've had a horrific setback of injuries and basically everybody that I've seen, every professional that I've seen about this hand from the doctor to the first orthopedic surgeon I've seen, to the nurses that are actually casting my hand, um, who I've actually become quite friendly with over the past year. <laughs> but uh, every one of them have said to quit, really. Um, that's what most people have said to me, is just pack it in. And I mean, I, I would ask the doctor, what's the best thing for me to do from here? Do you know what I mean? What's the best thing for my hand? And uh, they're like, have you considered like choosing another career? You know what I mean? Like your hand's not going to withstand this. And that's that's what they tell people. Like, and I think it's, I don't think it's fair. There was obviously thoughts of that's it. Obviously in the heat of the moment, but I thought at the time that that could be my career over. over. And I don't know, it was, it was, I remember just, getting out of crying for ages and getting out of the gym and just getting in my car and crying for like another half an hour and it felt like it felt like someone had died like like a piece inside of me had died that day i all i see in my mind is, is world champion i see that belt being put my, around my waist and i see that in the next three years they could really tell me anything but i have my dream and my goal so deeply engraved in my subconscious that nothing else like nothing else matters apart from that to me like it will it will happen do you know what i mean like i've literally engraved that so much i have believed that and seen that and visualized that so much that i know it's going to happen but it's just having the patience now to wait So you're going to be going like fast forward one year sort of yeah. thing, so right? So you'll be rolling up to, to now. Yeah. So one year later, pretty much one year later. Um, so How's went, the hand? the hand is fully mended, ready to go. Like, so got surgery in March of last year. It's now March 2019. Or no, it's February 2019, but I'll be fighting in March 2019. Um, so this time last year, um, the last time I was talking to you, was a week before I got my surgery and at this 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 stage that was fourth handbrake in 12 months basically f although although I always knew like I would push through it but that was that was a tough time and getting the surgery and getting repaired was was fantastic knowing that I've got something different done I wasn't just letting it heal naturally was very fortunate to get it repaired by the best hand surgeon in the country so basically it was repaired and then now what? Now what's the plan? That's, that was the mindset. So the doctors, the, the specialist said, look, it's gonna be 2019 before you can compete again, which was a big thing for me to take because after all the time off I'd already had, that would have been a year, a full year at a competition. When they were saying a full year, I thought I can't, be, I can't stay in this country and just do what I'm doing for a year because it'll just be horrible for my mental health. Like it's being, because I pretty much, I'm in the gym every day, whether I'm coaching or I'm training. So my life is in the gym, progress, trying to be the best person that I can be and the best fighter that I can be. I just couldn't stick a year of being in the gym every day, knowing that I wasn't fighting. I thought, right, I need a game plan for this year. I had to get myself out of my current situation. I couldn't sit around at home for a year, not being able to fight especially after everything that's happened. So I thought, right, it's time to do some traveling again. 
didn't have any money, but I thought I need to travel again. So I was actually born in Sydney, in Australia. So I've got an Australian passport. And my sister had just moved out there and I thought, now is the time to do it. I've always wanted to move back. So like since I was a kid, I always wanted to go back, but it was it would never suit it with fighting. So I thought, right, now is the time to go fulfill that because I've got I've got 10 months to 12 months. I've almost got a full year of out of competition. So booked the flights after this after that hand that healer got out of the cast, booked the flight straight away. I was in Australia the week after. So my schedule in Australia. And when I, when I look back at it, I'm like, how the fuck did I do that for so long? But I know why I done it because of how bad I want it. It's literally simple. A schedule in Australia for the majority of time I was there was up at 5 a.m., leaving the house just after 5 a.m., drive an hour, maybe over an hour to work outside of the city, work for 10 hours with two breaks, two half an hour breaks on a construction site, all, all labor, all labor. Terrible work, like terrible work, horrible. Like just m miserable, pe miserable people, do you know what I mean? Like miserable bosses on the construction site. Although it wasn't raining, it was very hot. Um, so that was that was the schedule. But as I said, most days I would try to get out early or I would make an excuse because I needed to get to the gym. Put in two to three hours, as much time as I could. Try to keep with up with all these pros. Like shout out to Australian top team as well for having me there when I was there. Great gym, lots of good fighters, hungry fighters that kept me sharp too. So I was trying to keep up with guys who were training full time and trust me, I kept up because nobody wants it more than me. Nobody wants it more than me and that's that's it. So I went and I put my two to three hours in every single night after doing a 10 hour day. So that most nights I wasn't getting home to maybe 9.30, 10 p.m. and that's leaving the house from 5 a.m. and that's Monday through Friday. More the majority of the time I was there. I feel now that I have like conquered more of adversity than people do in their whole careers. And I'm 21, I'm still 21 years old. I'm a pro debut when I was 19. I'm now 21. I've almost felt what it's like to be retired in the sport. Although I never ever stopped tra training or never ever, even, never even thought about stopping training. It was almost like I had retired because I was out of the game for so long and I was able to watch everybody else improve the game, improve the game do amazing things and I had to watch that so pretty much I like I've I'm, I've used this now my greatest weakness now to my advantage so, because as I say like nobody's gonna break me nobody can break my mindset now after all that I've been through to come back and be stronger than ever that that is a testament to my mindset so if a guy thinks he's gonna make me mentally break in a cage never ever in a million years would that happen like there is there's just no way i would ever after all i've been through quit like there is no quit in my mind like you will never break me like i just i am unbreakable you will not break me and that's that's why i'm going to be world champion since i've got home i haven't left the gym it's now february it's now the end of february and i haven't I've done nothing since I get home, apart from training my absolute ass off. I've do done nothing but live in the gym. That's that's all I wanted to do when I was in Australia, working these 10 hour days, driving for four hours a day. I just couldn't wait to get back to my day one coaches and just put the absolute work in. All I was looking forward to when I was away. Yes, I had a good time when I was away. I enjoyed my time, do you know what I mean? I learned a lot of new things, learned, met a lot of great people. I mean, traveled a lot, learned a lot about myself, not outside of fighting as well. But there's just nothing. When your mindset is so fixed on one thing, and that is world champion, I never doubted that for a second that I would be world champion. When your mind is just fixed on that one thing, it's craving it, it's craving it, it's craving it. I just needed to be back what doing what I'm doing right now, and that is with my day one coaches and grinding my absolute ass off. I fucking love it. I'm, I'm savoring it more this time. You know, it's been so long, so I'm savoring it. Every fucking, I'm taking time to myself just to appreciate being back here. That's fucking. That's good. It's been a long journey.
kind of this state of limbo in my career almost where that's why it's so unbelievably hard to get the fights. It's because I'm 2-0, oh, right? My two people watch my two fights. They see Bama, they see the first fight, and they think, I don't want any of that. And then they watch my last one, which was also a first round TKO, and where, where it was just utter destru destruction in both fights. Like, and, and there's no other way to put it. It was one-sided dominance against a 22-year-old kid who's young, hungry, and full of confidence, like stating on the regular that he's going to be world champion. That that gets in people's heads. They don't. They think, well, why would I fight this guy if I could just get this other can? Do you know what I mean? Or somebody less good? So I'm at that state of limbo where I've had two fights, but really, if I didn't have the two-year layoff with injuries, I should have eight fights, nine fights. Do you know what I mean? So I'm at my level doesn't reflect my record. So for guys, I've accepted fight, fights again, as I said, guys with eight fights, nine fights, in the prime of their career, coming towards the end of their career. And they, they, it doesn't make sense for them to lose against a guy that's 2-0. And as I say, I can, I absolutely see where they're coming from. 100%, I, put my, I try to put myself in other people's shoes to, to understand where they're coming from. But as I say, it's just that, that terrible state of limbo in my career where this shit's happening. I would count maybe, maybe nine, eight to nine blatant, no, we won't fight Paul. That was blatantly that what was happening. Other fights, they just said, no, the guy can't fight or whatever. But these are reputable shows, do you know what I mean? So I'm counting the reputable shows here. And- What do you think it is, just padding records? It's absolutely padding records. That's it's exactly what it is. It's fucking insane, mate. All these empty promises and fights happen, not fight, fights. Uh, it's fucking. You got the mindset for it though. If it's I gonna do, happen to someone, you're probably the only person that would stick through it. Uh, like as I said, I I I am a special athlete. Like I'm, I don't give a fuck what people say. Like I can say that about myself because I know what I've overcame already, and I know what I'm still overcoming, and what I will continue to overcome. And you know what? Another, I will be. Although this fight on Tuesday, although I got the news on Tuesday that this fight's off and I might have a fight to September, you bet your ass I was still training the next day. I was sprinting the next morning at 10 a.m., 30 fucking 100% sprints, straight to a pad session, rest straight to another session the next day. Like anybody else would throw their head up and I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm staying ready in case of a pullout somewhere in the next three weeks. Even after everything that's happened over the last, four months, I'm still gonna stay ready in the next few weeks in case something pulls up, keep my weight down and keep my, my fitness high. Like I'm, for example, my, I have a cousin, my cousin is getting married on Saturday and I'm not going to the wedding. And I obviously wasn't going because I thought I had this fight. But even now, I still can't go because in case I'm fighting, so I have to be doing my training sessions and I have to be up early and sparring on a Sunday morning even though the, the likelihood of me getting a fight is, is fucking 5%. So the, like that's just, the, it's, there's a small thing, well not a small thing, it's of course a big event, the wedding, but that's just a, an example of this, uh, some of the sacrifices that we maintain and even now after all that's happening, I still can't, I still can't do it. I still have to stay ready. And that's been four months, <laughs> four months of that, six months of that. So that's, that's where we're at at the minute. And I'm, and I'm incredibly frustrating time in my career. And I know it's everything happens for a reason and all that, but it's very hard to see that at the minute after after so many different pullouts and different and lies. And it's very hard, just a hard, hard part of my career. I'm probably waking up 73 kg. A week and a half ago, I was 77. Put that in perspective. Into perspective. Do you know what I mean? And as I say, I'm, I'm a flight or a featherweight fighter. I fight at 66, but we can't get anybody to fight me at 66. So we're moving up weight to fight somebody. So luckily, I'm able to fucking do my hard session here now. Otherwise, the whole time would have just been make weight. Do you know what I mean? So it just shows you how fucking important it is to just stay fucking ready at all times. You always hear it, I'm always ready to go, but like not a lot of people are. And a lot of people would not accept that fight in such short notice. 
like myself. Do you know what I mean? Only people with certain mindsets. And I'll be honest, I doubted myself. I was like, am I gonna be ready for three weeks? I said, I waited so long to get back to the pinnacle of MMA. What if I go back and I fucking am not in fight shape? What if I've taken it in two months and, and, and too little notice? And then I said to myself, that's not what fucking world champions do. Man's work here. Nine days, seven days. <laughs> I'm going in the first round with him though too. When it was a white one. to the ground, trying to put some pressure on. He's under the throat here. And Hughes. Paul Hughes. Hughes takes the neck. Oh, this is Hughes right. with a big squeeze. Reach, reach, reach. Wow. Paul That's Hughes bad. with the first That's round bad. submission at Cage Warriors unplugged number two. That was clean. That, he looked very good there. 15 men didn't want it. And now you see why this prospect is the real deal. I'm, go I'm going to be the Cage Warriors featherweight champion. That's a done deal. I'm going to be the UFC featherweight champion as well. That's already done up here. And right now, to be honest, I think the featherweight division is born in Cage Warriors. Mass Burnell, born. What do you call that French? Morgan Chapa, born. Do you know what I mean? I would take them all out. Absolutely no problem. And I'm ready for them as well. I may be young. I may only be 22. But I'm ready for them. Godsland, around Lavi, County Derry. I mean, this is the this is part of the the ritual is coming down here on a Sunday and seeing Matt and Dad and chilling out basically after a hard week. This is where I'm from. This is where I come every Sunday to, to chill out to see Matt and Dad. This is where everything began for me. You know, me and my sporting journey and where majority of my life so far has been spent in this pitch with these lads, with with this community. Do you know I mean Lavi's Lavi's my home. It's so good to come down here. I try try to come down every Sunday to see my man and dad. Um, especially after hard weeks training, which is <laughs> which is every week. It's so nice to come down and just just chill out. Obviously to see them, it's, a, it's so important. Do you know what I mean? They're like my two best friends as well. I'll never forget where I'm from. Lavi will always be such a huge part of my life. Do you know what I mean? My brother still, all my all my friends playing the team still. Like if I hadn't found MMA, I'd still be there with the lads on the pitch here at the minute. I just took a, a little little detour 
first dream growing up was watching the seniors. Do you know what I mean? Watching the Lavi OGs, you know what I mean? Big Kevin McCloy, like all them lads. Like, it was always sort of the, the thing I looked at was like being like, I can't wait to have a senior to like, everybody's out watching the games and it's so competitive and it's high standard and there's, there's and it's, it's taken so seriously. Do you know what I mean? Like people's lives, this is people's lives and it was and still is a big part of my life. But like the passion and the, and the community that the GAA brings is just, unbelievable and it's it's like uh, it's such a good way to grow up to have this environment. I think the reason that I fell in love with MMA so much was the competitiveness of it and obviously that's why I loved the GAA as well and I loved I loved being here in the games because it was competitive. You know I mean I always loved sport obviously but it was the, that competitive side of MMA where it's just you in the cage and nobody, like, it's literally all down to you. Do you know what I mean? If it goes right, it's all down to you. If it goes wrong, it's all down to you. It's just the ultimate form of competition. Getting locked into a cage and fighting another trained killer. It sounds sort of corny, but I always knew that I would make something of myself. And I know you sort of, it sounds sort of funny, but I always knew I had the potential to be really good at something and to be great. Like, as I said about, like, playing ga, like, as a, as a, as a kid, and as a teenager, like I always left my heart and soul on the pitch. Like I just, I just, I loved sport, I loved competing, um, but I just always knew, I always knew that I was going to do something with myself. And I think because I've, I've always been a workhorse, I've always been willing to put the work in to whatever I do. I was always the kid that was staying after training, coming before training, going for extra runs. Like that was me always. That was, that was always me. I was always just willing to put the extra work in. And I know, like, you can have talent, but, I mean, you gotta have the hard work as well. So I knew I would be great at something. And it's, it's crazy how, like, you hear about the butterfly effect and how, how certain wee small things can influence you and influence your life then. Finding MMA was the turning point in, in my life, I feel. Since then, and since I started competing, like at a high level at amateur, then I started just realizing I can, I can be great. I mean, I can be, I can be something in this sport. I knew I was good, obviously, because I was fighting at the highest level at such, such a young age, but I never knew, or even at that point, believed the, believed in where I could go. And it was until probably my pro debut, where I won and, KO'd the guy in like 90 seconds. That I was in the SSE in Belfast, and I took that one in like a week's notice. Went in and s smoked the guy in the first round, and the whole fight went viral. Like there was a lot of hype, and after that, I was just like, "That's it. Like I'm all in." Do you know what I mean I know what I can do? Do you know what I mean I I know I can be a world champion in MMA? And there was a day where I just said, "That's it." You know what I mean I just wrote it down, world champion, Cage Warriors world champion. I read that down and we're well on track, you know what I mean? A couple of fights away and we'll get that. Yeah, this is incredible back and forth stuff there. Yeah, Paul Hughes has had success with that switch multiple times in this fight. He finally gets to the back position, 10 seconds left. Let's see what he does. He tries to put an explanation mark on the end of this fight, and there he goes. Hughes looking for a big combination to end this one. Vichenik firing back with big shots of his own. Oh my goodness, what a fight. After three rounds of mixed martial arts action, we go to our judges' scorecards. Your judges score this contest 29-28. Vucenic, 29-28. Hughes, and 29-28 for your winner by way of split decision. In the blue corner, Jordan. Since the last fight, maybe for five minutes after they made the, the judges' decision, I was disappointed, but after that, as soon as I got to watch the fight back, I wasn't disappointed because in my mind, like I know I won that fight, and that's not like a disrespect. Like that's just my opinion. That's how I scored it. How, of course, all my team have scored it. <laughs> no bias, but uh, I haven't seen it as a setback at all. Every fight, you learn so much, and I'm starting to really appreciate that. I appreciate that as I move on in my career is how valuable experience is. 
because of, as I say, the amount that you learn each fight, each preparation, each build up, each actual fight, how you react to certain situations in a fight, because you can tell a lot from a fight, because ultimately you're just doing what's coming natural to you in a fight, especially last round, you're tired, you're just doing what's coming natural to you. So that's why these repetitions are just so important in training, and that's why training is so daunting at times, because it's just the reps and reps and reps for weeks and weeks and weeks. You're going from one fight to the other fight, but that's why I say about motivation, like it's a funny, it's a funny sort of word to be, because I don't know if I'm more motivated after that last loss, because to me it is just all discipline, and my discipline is just there always. So it is what it is. Like I've been back since I haven't stopped since that last fight. I was back to training the next week. Since the first week of the year, it's been fight camp, and I'm already three weeks into that. I feel I feel incredible already. Everyone's positive. It's it's living there. Like everyone is positive from that last fight. I know so many things I need to improve. Composure, I've been impressed with my composure. Um, one thing about the last fight was the pace. I was, it was great to get like such a high pace fight because I know deep down, and, and I knew this anyway from other fights, that when the going gets tough, I get going. Like, and I, I think it was pretty evident in the last round. Both guys were just scrambled. I feel like I was 100% pushing the pace towards the end of that third round with the scrambles. And with, for example, the last 15 seconds, I could have just held on and tried to hold my way to victory, land a few strikes, but I went break off and I just went, <laughs> I just emptied the tank for 15 seconds. And I guess that's that's like a positive, knowing that I'm willing to just empty the tank every time. So people people will use any excuse. They'll use any excuse not to train. If they're fucking a couple of training partners can't make it or coach can't make it at night, they'll go, I oh, will just leave it, but that's not how you become the best in the world. You know what I mean? Becoming the best in the world is coming in here at 11 a.m. and sparring for an hour and a half, two hours, and men getting in the treadmill. It's fucking, what time is it? Half one. It's like, this is Sunday service. Sunday's being served today, like every Sunday. It's just no substitute for hard work, and this game's all hard work, and that's what I'm willing to do to get that world title, and that's what I'm gonna get this year, and that's just that. I think it's going to be a five rounder. I think it's going to be a decision and whatever way the judges put it, to me it doesn't matter. I want them both and I'm sure I'll get them both at some point this year. Mm -hmm. Jordan will get that rematch back if he wins. I did in London here or in Belfast. And if Chaba gets the win, then I would love to take that belt off him in Paris. probably 11 weeks out from the next show. Now, I still don't know what the situation is with the featherweight division. With the champion, he's out. I can only assume that they're gonna do an interim belt, which means your boy's there. Like, I'm ready for that, I'm ready for that belt. Well, it should be against the, the born little Frenchman, Morgan Chapa. I know it's about the belt, but it has been very much about Morgan Charrier for you as well. He came into Cage Warriors. Um, would that be? Would that feel like very much unfinished business if you never got to challenge him under the Cage Warriors banner? Uh, yes, it definitely will. Like that's the fight that I've been wanting. As you, as you just know, I've been calling. I've been calling for that since March of last year, and I've visualized that. I kn I know what is going to happen, whether that's in Cage Warriors or in the UFC. I know I'll beat that man, and I know a lot of hype will be built up before that fight. <laughs> Like I, I literally visualized all of us. Like I visualized the walkout song. I visualized at the time when I was visualizing that I was thinking Chab because Chaba just became champion. That's who I knew was gonna be there. And this was like a year and a half, probably two years ago, or whatever the fuck it was. Knew the walkout song. Knew that I was gonna walk out with the flag for an award title fight. And like just the fact that everybody was able to be there for the first time since the pandemic happened, all my fights have been fucking no crowd. Although in my mind, there's thousands of people cheering to have it actually there tonight was just...
not just Paul on this journey, it's everyone. And it takes everyone to come along with him. He's not any extra special than anyone here. Just works hard, shows up every day, non-stop, consistent. This song was coming for two years and I couldn't play it. I, that's why I said in the airport, is this the song this we're going to use? I was like, finally. Fighting out of the red corner, he stands by B9 Jassau. 144 points, one pound. She's fighting out of Lowy in Northern Ireland and brings him into the cage. A professional record of seven wins with one defeat. Introducing to you, Paul Hughes. Senna, please. Gentlemen, you're going to protect yourselves at all times. That's it. You know what I mean? I just read it down. World champion. Cage Warriors world champion. When your mind is just fixing that one thing, it's craving it, it's craving it, it's craving it. I just needed to be back what, doing what I'm doing right now, and that is with my day one coaches and grinding my absolute ass off. They could really tell me anything, but I have my dream and my goal so deeply engraved, it will happen. I have believed that and seen that and visualized that so much that I know it's gonna happen, but it's just having the patience now to wait. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fuck me. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Oh. It was easy. Oh. Oh. Winning, <laughs> winning this has no, I mean. a fucking cost. That's it. Winning this has a fucking cost that nobody knows. Yep. Only the people who get here know what the cost is, but they'll not tell you. And sometimes the cost is more than the fucking achievement. And that's what they don't understand about this game. They just think this, they see the crowd, they see the shiny belt, and they think he's talented. He's fucking talented, that guy. 
they don't understand what it costs to get here and they don't understand what it took me to get there tonight and them tests them tests are the filter them tests are the filter there to see who really fucking wants it who really really people people talk many talk but few execute few execute Oh my god, <laughs> When I fought Hendon, you said on the broadcast it was like like I'm one of the biggest prospects period in, in Europe and that really meant a lot. It was like one of these moments in my career where like it was like one of the best moments of my career because it was like like a solidification for me that like oh I'm on the right path because it's alright when somebody somebody says that but it's somebody who I consider one to be one of the best men in the game's ever seen. Ever says that about you when you're 23 with the age I was, it was, it was a real solidification for me. So, I want to thank you for that. And well, you proved me right, yeah, you proved me right, right? Yeah, well, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. But, fuck. yeah, I just want to thank you, man. And, yeah, no yeah you're a fucking big inspiration. Thank you, man. Yeah, Paul, Ariel, are you there? I come to you, <laughs> and I picked the wrong guy, Paul. I Ariel, what's all this? What's this? <laughs> Hey, what's all this French bollocks about in the <laughs> MMA? <laughs> uh, we'll see. You're the young protege of yours. Do you go and do this. Well, I'll, I'll correct you there. He inspires me, not the other way around. He, uh, he's, oh, he's just such a hard worker. Um, you know, like people see this young, confident, talented guy and think, oh, well, it must come easy. But they don't actually see the hard work that he puts in. Nobody in the gym. Works harder. In fact, there's nobody that I know in MMA that works harder than me. This is fucking crazy. This is fucking crazy. <laughs> My life has just changed <laughs> forever. You may fucking not bust any more of them. <laughs> right, you, you, you tell them all that. Aye, right, but right, where are we going to start going? Oh. <laughs> you know, getting louder and louder, and as you see him, he's going, yeah, I'm going at him. <laughs> <laughs> not just Paul on this journey, it's everyone. And it takes everyone to come along with him. Because if it wasn't for him going to his mum and hugging her and all the people there, you know, wanting to do them proud and do all of us proud, then, you know, the journey wouldn't be so special. What makes it special is winning that belt, yes, but coming back home and seeing how much it means to everyone else and how much everyone else is so happy for Paul because everyone cares so much about him, and we all see the work he puts into it. You know, there's, there, there's nobody works harder. There, there's really not, like, and he's a really, really good role model for everyone here, not just the young lads, for everybody here. He, he's an example of, of hard work pays off. You know, hard work costs nothing. It doesn't. He's not any extra special than anyone here. Just works hard, shows up every day, nonstop, consistent.
Oh, oh, holy fuck. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> oh, fuck, he's gonna cry again. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Fuck oh, me. Close it up, close it, Jesus. You know what I'm saying is you need a village to raise a child. Yeah? You need a team to raise a child. You know what I mean? So Paul's here. He's been everywhere around the world, but he's here. And there's a reason why he's here. It's because he's got a great team around him, so that's all use. All the ones coming through, all the senior fighters, everybody that coaches that, right? So as Pat says, everything is here for you. Yeah! Yes, <laughs> My goodness, did he earn that? <laughs> Why they all take their? Why did my friends take their tops off? The mad bastards! Why would they take their tops off for? <laughs> like, <laughs> makes no sense. They're literally wearing my tops. Like, keep them on. <laughs> Right hand, of course, right hand of the Lord.